record and do a screen share here. Okay. Now we'll pop over to my um, notes and we want a new note. There we go. All right, guys, I think all of us are here. Any questions from last time? I know some of you guys are working on your homework. Several folks have talked to me about that and have answered a few questions, which is fine. Um, and I know some of you guys are working ahead and working toward the statistics and that kind of business. And my promise was, if at all possible today, to try to get through all of the lecture material we're gonna need to get through so you can finish that out and presumably be able to hand it to me tomorrow evening. So yeah, let's get right down to business with it then. So again, just a real quick summary of what we're gonna be looking at tomorrow um, in lab. So as soon as you come in, obviously you'll have your um, laboratory um, all written up and ready to go so we can start actually doing the experiment. So those sections you wanted to write up will be written up. <coughs> then the other thing we're gonna do is um, a short quiz, basically on the material we've learned up till now and the kind of material that would be on your homework. So as long as you got all that done, you should be in good shape. Go back and look at your notes and make sure you know, you're know you comfortable with your procedure because questions from the little quiz we're gonna do can come from those things. All right, so then once you finish the quiz, we'll just get right on into the calibration of the burette. And if I have any final instructions or anything like that, I need to let you know that's when we'll do that. All right, so we were talking about tolerances of measuring devices last time. Right, so for example, if I had a 50 milliliter burette, what we can find is that the tolerance on a 50 mil burette, and I think we said that last time, is gonna be plus or minus 0 0.05 milliliters as the burette is delivered from the factory, okay? So what that means, is that if I have a volume that I read on that burette, so let's say I've used that 50 mil burette and I read off of it a volume of let's say 10.20 milliliters, that's the reading I have, okay? It tells me that the actual value is gonna be somewhere between 10.250 plus 0.05. So that's gonna be what, 10.25? and 10.20 um, minus 0.5, which would be what, 10.15? Okay, so that's basically telling me that the actual value should lie somewhere within that window. Now, the whole point of calibrating the burette tomorrow is that we might be able to, with a careful calibration, bring that tolerance down a little bit at any given increment in volume. Okay, so maybe at the 10 milliliter mark, Maybe with a proper calibration, we can say that your burette's really good to plus or minus 0 0.02 milliliters or 0 0.03 milliliters. Okay, but this is what the burette's good for across its entire range as delivered from the factory. It's the plus or minus 0 0.05. That's what they guarantee. Okay, so same thing we could say, for example, with an analytical balance. We said an analytical balance is going to be good to the fourth decimal place because that's what it's designed to do. So we say that's the tolerance of that measuring device. All right. So the other thing that we have to think about here is that when we talk about utilizing data like this, let's say I've got a volumetric measurement like this. Let's say I've got two volumes or even in this case, if I wanted to calculate a total volume dispensed from a burette, how would I do it? Well, my V total from my burette would equal to my V final minus my V initial, right? So let's just say my V total in this case might be 10.50 milliliters on my um, final minus where I started. Let's say that's going to be, um, uh, let's see. Uh, 5.00 or something like that. 
Okay, and that's milliliters. So what does that turn out to be? 10.5 minus five, what's that gonna be like? Um, 5.50, 5. 5. yeah. Thank you. I don't do math in my head very well. All right, so now what you notice here is that I did a mathematical operation based on two observations that I made, okay? And each one of these observations has a tolerance or precision associated with it. This one right here is gonna be, let's say plus or minus 0.05 mils. That's my tolerance on that. Now, if I'm at five mils, let's say I'm the same thing. My burette's calibrated or delivered as a tolerance of 0.05 mils at five mils, as well as it is at 10.50 mils. Okay, that should be a 0.05, sorry guys, there we go. So here's the question. I now have an uncertainty associated with each one of those measurements, right? As based on the tolerance, that's defining for me the number of sig figs, but it's also telling me where the actual value is within a given window of measurement. Now the question now is what would the error or the precision on the final calculation be? What would the calculated error associated with the measuring device be for the calculated amount? Is it 0.05? Well, it turns out, no, it's not. What ends up happening is when I take two or more measurements using one or more measuring devices and I make calculations based on those things, what ends up happening is we get something called propagation of error. And what propagation of error really says is that the total error associated with the final value, that's the 5.50, actually builds out. In other words, it's going to be greater than the individual errors associated with each of the measurements that we used in the calculation. Okay, so in other words, the calculated error is always going to be bigger than the error of the individual measurements. We'll say used in the calculation. So the question then becomes, well, how do I calculate how error propagates? In other words, if I have that um, specific um, operation up there that I do, V final minus V initial, how do I propagate the error? Obviously I know how to take the difference between those two measurements and get a difference, but what does the propagated error look like in terms of an actual amount, plus or minus whatever milliliters, right? So as it turns out, there's several ways to calculate the propagation of error. And how we do it kind of depends upon what the um, actual operation is. So what we're gonna find, kind of like the sig figs, is that we're gonna have rules for adding and subtracting and we're gonna have rules for multiplication and division. All right, so a couple of different definitions we have to use before we actually get into those rules. Okay, so these are basically several types of uncertainties or errors. So the first is called absolute uncertainty. All right, and that's gonna be the uncertainty associated with a given measurement as defined by the tolerance of the measuring device. Okay, so we'll say it's defined by the tolerance of the measuring device, just like we saw above. All right, so that's the one we were talking about just above there with regard to like the burette, right? So if we said that, if we have a burette, okay, and I'm making a reading at 20.00 milliliters if it's a 50 mil burette, 
All right, I know that's good to plus or minus 0 0.05 milliliters. So that plus or minus 0 0.05 milliliters is the absolute uncertainty associated with the measurement. It's defined specifically by the tolerance of the measuring device. Okay, so that's one way of casting that tolerance or uncertainty that we can use in a subsequent calculation. Second way of defining this is as a percent relative uncertainty. And basically what that is, is this. It's gonna be the ratio of the absolute uncertainty as we just defined it. Over the magnitude of the measurement. All right, times 100% to turn it into a percent. So for example, if I wanted to get the percent relative uncertainty of the uh, tolerance on the burette, as I see it above, here's how I would do it. I'll call it RU for relative uncertainty. So I need the absolute uncertainty. Okay, we know that for the burette at 20 milliliters, we know that's plus or minus 0.05 mils. So we'll put the 0.05 mils up here. And now I need to define or rather divide that by the magnitude of the measurement. So what's the size of the measurement we were making with the burette? Looks like it's 20 mils, right? Everybody see what I did there? And then turn that into a percent by multiplying by 100%. So notice that this is going to have units of percent because it's a percent relative uncertainty. And you end up getting 0.3% out of this. Okay, so what I've got here are basically two ways to um, cast or define an uncertainty, either as an absolute uncertainty or a percent relative uncertainty, and they both are defined ultimately by the tolerance of the measuring device. Okay, everybody see the differences between those? Now the real question is, well, when do I use each one? Well, I use each one when we want to calculate error propagation. Okay, so as I said before, if I'm going to end up taking um, measurements using measuring devices and each one has a tolerance associated with it, and I'm going to then use those numbers to calculate some other final value, okay, because I'm using those numbers in calculations, the errors associated with the measurements will propagate. Okay, so here's where we get to the rules of propagation of uncertainty or error. All right, so first of all, we said we had the addition and subtraction rule. So again, the operation here that we're doing is addition or subtraction. So for example, this would be where I'm um, subtracting a, uh, an initial measurement from a final measurement with a burette, like I showed you before. That's subtracting, so that's what's happening here. So now I wanna find out the total error associated with that operation, okay? Here's what it turns out to be. It's the square of E1 to the quantity squared plus E2 to the quantity squared plus E3 to the quantity squared. And then we can just keep adding terms as we need to. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take all of that once we're done and we're gonna take the square root of it or take it all to the one half power. Now, these little E's down here represent absolute errors or uncertainties. Okay, so if we're doing addition or subtraction, we're gonna use absolute uncertainties to calculate the total error associated with the calculation. So you can then see that the error is gonna propagate. And you see what's happening basically, we're summing the squares of those errors together and taking the square root of that sum at the very end. So you can see that the error is going to add essentially um, based on every measurement we make, okay? Now, the other example or situation you run into is gonna be the um, multiplication and division rule. Now, it looks the same, only now when we multiply and divide, 
we're not going to use absolute uncertainties. We're going to be using relative percent uncertainties. Okay, so that's how we're going to couch the total error here. It says a relative percent uncertainty total. So I'll call that a percent E. And we're going to do it the very same way. So basically, now it's going to be a percent E for measurement one. We're going to square it plus the percent E for measurement two squared. And we'll just keep on adding terms as we need to, depending upon how many operations we're doing here. OK, and then at the end, I'm going to take the square root of the whole thing. All right. So the equation's the same in terms of calculating um, the um, propagated error. But keep in mind, you're using um, absolute uncertainty in the case of addition and subtraction, and you're using relative percent uncertainty if we're multiplying and dividing. And we'll do an example of one of these so you can actually see what we're talking about here. Now, this is actually something I have my analytical students do in the third or fourth year when they go back and kind of relearn how to pipette and use a burette and all of this kind of stuff. So this is actually an example I have them do so you guys can remember this when you get to analytical. And you guys who've had analytical might remember doing this, okay? So what we're gonna do is use a one mil pipette And it's going to be an auto pipette. I think everybody's used those at some time or another. And we want to deliver five mils of water. Okay, so you can see what the problem here is going to be. My auto pipette only calibrates up to a milliliter, right? So how am I going to actually um, get five milliliters total using an auto pipette? What do I have to do? Bring over uh, five different one milliliter quantities and then you have to do absolute uncertainty. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I got to do it five times, right? So here's the thing. I'm going to end up doing this. I'm going to take five aliquots of one milliliter each. Okay, and I'm gonna add them together to get my five milliliter total. Now, of course, I've left my sig figs out of this for now, okay? So then the question is, okay, if I've got a one milliliter out of pipette, I have to go find out what the um, published uncertainty on that device is, right? Because that's easy enough for the burette like we talked about, right? I can go to the burette and I'd say, okay, I know that the manufacturer gives me the burette good to plus or minus 0.05 milliliters at any volume measure. Now, in this case, if I'm looking full scale at a um, auto pipette, I can go to the Harris textbook that has it, and it'll tell you for an automatic pipette, the one milliliter total volume, what's the uncertainty look like? Now, here's the interesting thing. For the auto pipette, Harris tells me, okay, that the tolerance for that is equal to 0.3 plus or minus. 0.3%. Okay. Now here's the deal. What kind of an uncertainty is that? It's not an absolute uncertainty. That's a relative percent uncertainty, isn't it? Okay. But what is my operation here? My operation is adding those five aliquots together. So somebody mentioned, what kind of uncertainty do I need to use if I'm adding these five aliquots together? Do I want a percent relative or do I want an absolute? No, you want an absolute. I need an absolute, okay? I need an absolute associated with each one of those measurements. So what do you think I'm gonna do with that plus or minus 0.3%? What should I do? I need to convert it over to a absolute uncertainty, don't I? So I have to kind of undo that percent. So what have I really got? When I talk about 0.3%, where did I get that? Okay, that's my absolute uncertainty divided by the measurement itself, right? So if I were to write it out, that's going to be essentially 0 
okay, per one milliliter, right, times 100%. So if I wanted to undo that, how would I undo that? Well, I'd have to basically divide by 100 and multiply by one, wouldn't it? And that would undo that for me. Okay, so basically I've got my 0.3%. Now I'm gonna divide by the 100% to take it back in the opposite direction and then multiply by the one milliliter, right? Okay, so notice what happens. The percents actually cancel out and I end up with milliliters and you end up with what, 0 0.003 milliliters. So all I did was there was I undid the percent relative uncertainty to convert it back to an absolute uncertainty. Where did the one milliliter come from? Well, that's the um, full scale size of the aliquot. So I know that that's the um, size of the measurement that I'm making. Okay, so now I know what I've got. I've got one milliliter plus or minus 0 0.003 milliliters all the way down, right? So now I've got this in terms of something I can work with. So now how do I calculate the propagation of the error? Okay, because I'm adding five um, aliquots together. I know that each aliquot has a um, absolute uncertainty of 0 0.003 mils. Now I can get my um, total error. So we go back to our equation, right? So what does it say I have to do? It says that I have to say 0 0.003 milliliters and I got to square it, right? Got to add them a bunch of them together. There's four of them, right? Need one more. And then I'm going to take the square root of that whole thing once I do all of those. Okay. So when I work that out, you guys can verify this for me, I end up getting a total absolute uncertainty associated with the um, calculation of 0 0.007 milliliters. Now, the interesting thing to note here is that's bigger than the individual um, error of the measurement, right? The individual error of any one of those aliquots is just 0 0.003 milliliters. But now I've more than doubled that because I see that I'm propagating the error by essentially making the measurement five times, okay? And that's what ends up happening. All right, any questions about that? And that should help kind of guide you in terms of, I think that third problem that I gave you guys on the homework. That's one where I think you have to calculate a molarity and I give you some, I think, absolute uncertainties there. And you have to come up with an uncertainty associated with that calculation, okay? So this should give you some guidance on how to do that. I have a question with that equation and I guess with the sure. other one. So if there's different values for the E's for the absolute uncertainties, you just add those in separately. So there can be different values for E's within the equation or would you have to do that separately? No, they can be. It depends on what you're adding together. So for example, if I were using a different pipette that had a different absolute uncertainty to do part of these measurements, then I would have to use that absolute uncertainty associated with that other pipette. So yeah, you're exactly right. So yeah, if I use the same device at the same volume, yeah, that's gonna be the same. But even if I change the volume, that might actually change the um, absolute uncertainty associated with the measurement. So instead say that I did two mils of this at one milliliter, and then I did the rest of them at say half a milliliter. Well, chances are, if I go to half a milliliter, that's going to change the um, uncertainty associated with the measurement. So then that number would change. So yes, you're right. You have to be careful of that. And I think that ends up actually kind of happening in your um, homework because you're calculating a molarity and you're using like different measurements using different devices that have different uncertainties associated with them. So that does pop up in your homework. That answer your question? Yeah, I did. All right, excellent. Okay, guys, now we change gears a little bit. And this is going to be sort of how we end up the um, lecture here. And that's where we want to talk about statistics. That's the last problem in your homework.
All right. So statistics basically are going to be used for any set of data that we take in the quant lab. So what we want to do here is to assess in some way, shape, or form random variations in our measurements or in our data. So remember, we have two different kinds of measurements that we can have. We can have um, determinant measurements or errors or errors associated with measurements that are determinant. Those are ones that we can identify and correct, right? But then we can have indeterminate or random errors associated with our measurements. And those just come about based upon random fluctuations in the measurement that we have no control over. Okay, so, you know, you weigh a penny, one day you weigh it, it might be a little high, one day you weigh the same penny, it might read a little lower, and you didn't do anything differently, okay? It's just a random variation in the measurement as you make it. Okay, so that's what statistics is all about, is trying to pin down what that range of measurement would be based upon random error that we cannot control. Now, again, in the quant lab, we utilize statistics all the time, and the reason we do it is because we assume that we have mitigated all of the determinant error and we're really just left at the mercy of the indeterminate or random error. Now, of course, we know that's really not true, but that's the assumption that we have to make, okay? So the idea here when we apply statistics is that we're going to be utilizing a set of identical measurements. So for example, in the quant lab, you might take an average, and an average is based on statistics, of say four concentrations that you measured in the quant lab. So the presumption that the, what you're gonna presume is that you measured those concentrations exactly the same way, okay? So when you calculate a mean, you're assuming that the error associated with the measurement of those concentrations is random, okay? Same with your standard deviation, and um, the other one we're gonna do, which is the 95% confidence limiter interval. So here are the various statistical parameters that we're going to play with. Okay, so the first one's gonna be the mean. Okay, so a mean is basically the same thing as an average. We kind of use those two, at least in our world, interchangeably. Now, what does it represent? Well, if I have a distribution of measurements, right? So let's say I made the same measurement a thousand times. So I have what's called a population mean there. In other words, I've got a whole bunch of identical measurements. So I can kind of take this to the bank because I have so many of them. Okay, what you're gonna end up actually getting if you actually look at it, is you're gonna get something that looks like a bell curve. Okay? So basically your measurement would be down here on the um, axis, so whatever this turns out to be, let's say I'm measuring a mass of something, so I could have grams there. So I'm measuring masses of pennies or something like that, okay? And assuming all pennies are identical, you're gonna get a bell curve that looks something like this. And then of course, your y-axis here is going to um, be essentially number of events, okay? So the number of times that we actually see a specific mass being measured. Now, what the mean actually represents to us is basically the top of that bell curve. It's going to essentially be the most probable value of measurement that we would make. So if our bell curve is truly a bell curve and it's symmetrical on both sides, that mass right there would represent my mean at the top of the curve. In other words, half the measurements would be bigger and half the measurements would be smaller. Okay, so that would be more or less the most probable measurement that we would make. So we take it to be the closest representation of the true measurement. All right, so everybody I think knows how to calculate an average or a mean. It's actually a really simple calculation to do. Now, the mean in statistics is represented by what we call an X bar. And we calculate it this way. We say that the X bar is going to equal to the summation of the measurements of X divided by N, where N is the total number of measurements we make. 
Okay, so for example, if I wanted to get the average mass of a penny, what would I do? I could weigh that penny three times or five times or however many times I wanna do it, right? And I would get five separate masses for that penny because I made the observation five times. And then I would divide by the number of observations I made, which is five, and that would give me the average or mean mass of the penny, right? Everybody knows that's how you calculate a mean. You add up the number of observations you make and divide by the number of observations. Does that make sense to everybody? Any questions? That's the easy one. Like I said, everybody knows how to do that. All right, second one is we use something called the standard deviation. Now, whereas the mean is sort of a representation of the actual value, the standard deviation tells me something about the precision of the measurement. So it tells me something about the spread of the data. Okay, so it's a measurement of the spread of the data. Okay, so, you know, when we talked about accuracy versus precision before, okay, and we talked about like groupings, this is kind of a nice way to sort of show this. So if I had a target and I had three shots that were right in the center like that, okay, I look at that and I'd say, okay, that grouping is pretty tight. So what does that tell me about the standard deviation? Well, that tells me that if I have a tight grouping like that, I probably have a small standard deviation about the mean. So really what it corresponds to when you get down to it is the width of the bell curve up here, okay? So if you notice that the bell curve is really, really narrow, it tells me that I have sort of a narrow range of events or measurements that I'm making, okay? So if that bell curve, if I'm measuring, say, masses of pennies, and that bell curve is really narrow, then that tells me that all the masses of the pennies are very close to one another, very much like what I have here in my target, okay? But if it turns out that um, the range of measurements for my pennies turns out to be quite large, that causes the bell curve to get bigger, wider, fatter, right? And as the bell curve gets fatter, that tells me I've got an increasing standard deviation or I'm getting more spread in my observed data. So it all kind of goes back to kind of mathematically modeling and fitting, you know, the shape and width of that bell curve, okay? So that's what standard deviation tells us. So ultimately we can tie it back to our understanding of precision. And when I talk about precision here, I'm talking about our precision of measurement. In other words, if I do a number of repeated measurements, how close together are those individual measurements to each other? That's what I mean by precision here, okay? So if I have very precise data, that means I've got a tight grouping and a small standard deviation. But if my um, shots are kind of all over the target, that means I have poor precision. So that would suggest that I would have a larger standard deviation of measurement. Okay, so that's kind of what physically standard deviation means. Okay, so how do we calculate? Well, first of all, standard deviation is gonna be given the um, symbol of a lowercase s, and I use my s as a script so they don't look like fives, okay? So here's how I calculate it. Standard deviation, it's based on the mean, so it's this. It's the summation of each individual value x that I measure minus the mean. Remember, the mean is x bar. What I'm going to do is I'm going to square that term. Okay, so it's the summation of x minus x bar to the quantity squared. So I take the difference within the percent parentheses first, I square it, and then I do that across all my measurements and I sum those up. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to divide that by n. Now remember, n is the total number of measurements that I make, okay, minus one. And then when we subtract one from n, we call that the degrees of freedom. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the square root of that whole quantity. Okay, so 
calculating a standard deviation is all about order of operations. You have to make sure that you're doing everything in the right order. So here's how I was taught to do it in statistics class way back when I was a freshman in college. Okay, so I have a column of individual X's. So here's one measurement, here's another, here's another, here's another. So I've got a total of four measurements. So in this case, I know that my N is equal to four, right? So what do I do? Well, basically I work from the inside out. So here's my order of operations. I've got an X bar because I can calculate that easily. I've got a mean. Means are easy to calculate based on these four measurements, right? So my next column is gonna be this. It's gonna be X individual measurement minus X bar. And when I do that, I'm gonna get four new measurements or results of calculations, right? So that column is each individual X, my first one, for example, here, minus the mean gives me this one, okay? And then I just keep working across. Now what I wanna do is I wanna take that quantity and square it. So I'm gonna have another column, which I'll call X minus X bar, to, and I'm gonna parenthesis that and make it square. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the result of column two, and I'm gonna square it and get a new value. So you know, I'm just kind of working across here. I'll do this, this, and this. And then what does it tell me to do? It says to sum those. So I'm just gonna add down my column here and I'm gonna get the sum. Okay, so now what have I got? I've got the numerator, right? So now all I have to do is take that sum in my next step. And what am I gonna divide the sum by? Three. Three, yeah, my degrees of freedom, okay? And then what am I gonna do? Square root it. Yeah, take square root of the whole thing and I'm done, okay? So that kind of helps you keep track of the order of operations that you have to do, okay? Now the nice thing for you guys is that you have scientific calculators, programmable calculators, and you can probably actually program in standard deviation, or maybe it's already probably programmed into your calculator as a key punch function. So what ends up happening is you can just sort of put four numbers in as a data set and tell it to calculate a standard deviation and it can do that. Now, for example, if I asked you on a quiz or somewhere like that to show me that you know how to calculate a standard deviation based on a set of data, you'd want to show me that. And this is the best way to do it. So for example, on the homework that's due tomorrow, I ask you for a standard deviation. Okay, this is how I want you to show me to do it. So this way I know you've gone through the steps mathematically to get to it. Make sense? Are there any questions about, again, the order of operations that we have to go through or even physically what a standard deviation means? Okay, good. And then there's one more thing that we do, and we call this the student's t-test, and it defines for us a confidence interval. So when you think about this, what this is really kind of doing is it's kind of combining mean and standard deviation together. So when I have this thing called a confidence interval, what I'm actually doing here by way of a confidence interval is I'm defining a range of data. And it's usually about the mean. Because remember, the mean represents the um, most likely value or the true value. And what it was is it represents an interval within which 
the true value, whatever that is, of our measurement falls with a certain statistical probability. A lot of words here, but we'll explain it out. Okay, so if, for example, I define, let's say, a 95% confidence interval, and we have to define the size of the interval, okay? It could be a 90% confidence interval, it could be a 95% confidence interval, it could be a 99% confidence interval, but we have to define that. So what I'm actually saying is if I have a 95% confidence interval, I'm saying that I'm defining a range of data about the mean over which the true value falls within 95% statistical confidence, okay? So I'm 95% confidence that the actual value, whatever it is, falls within this range I'm going to define, okay? So how do I calculate? Well, the confidence interval is actually given with the symbol of mu, okay? So here's how mu is defined. Mu is equal to the mean, right? Because we say that the range has to be about the mean, so the mean has to fall in the middle of it, plus or minus this interval that we now define. That interval is t, and I'll come back and define what these are, times s divided by the square root of big N. All right, so x bar obviously here's the mean. S is gonna be the calculated standard deviation. N here is the total number of measurements. So none of those definitions are different. In other words, um, very same things we talked about in mean and standard deviation. Now, the big one that we have to worry about here is this T value. What's that? Well, that's that thing called student's T. It's magic value, okay? Now, where does it come from? Well, here's the deal. You get it from a table. Okay, and the student's T table is in your textbook and we're gonna use it a lot, okay? So I've got, I think if I pop out of here, I went over and saved somewhere um, a copy of the student's T table from one of my Harris um, volumes. So it should be the same as the one you guys have got. Let me see if I can find it. Um, it might actually be in here. I think it is actually in here. Here it is. Okay, so if you flip that, you can see it. I'm gonna flip mine 90 degrees here. Notice here, guys, that your confidence level is posted across the top there. Now we're gonna normally work at 95% confidence, okay? Let me see if I can uh, go away. There we are. Yeah. Let me see if I can put a pen on this for you. Okay, so we're gonna be usually working, eh, it's not gonna do it. I was hoping I could write on this, but we're going to be working at 95% confidence here. So everybody see the 95% confidence um, column there? Okay. Now look over to the left. You got degrees of freedom. Now what does degrees of freedom refer to? We talked about that. How Isn't do we that, that's N, right? Or Well, it's N minus one, right? N minus one, okay. Yeah, remember degrees of freedom is N minus one. You're on the right track. All right, so if I've got, let's, let's just come up with a scenario here. I want a 95% confidence level or interval, okay? And I've got four total measurements. What are my degrees of freedom? Three. Three. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find the degrees of freedom row there at three, and I'm gonna start working across until I get to 95% confidence. 
So find three and work across. What do you see at 95% confidence when you do that? What's the number for the T value? 3.182. 3.182. So there you go. That's the number you're going to grab and put into the um, confidence interval equation that I just gave you. Okay. So if we go back there, there's students T in there. That's the number you're going to stick in. So you're going to get it from the table. So it's going to depend upon the number of measurements that you make by way of the degree of freedom. And it's also going to depend upon the defined confidence level that you want. In our case, we're always going to work at 95%. Okay. Does that kind of sort of make sense to everybody? All right. So then there's one other thing that I need to mention to you, and I don't really remember whether I put this in the homework or not. I may have, but it's another thing that we have to think about when we're uh, dealing with statistics. Let's see, that was item two. Students T is really item three here. And then item four is dealing with outliers. This is important in the quant lab because Okay, what if you make four measurements, right? And your grade is based on accuracy and precision. And you find that one of those measurements, as they say in Sesame Street, is not like the others. Okay, so you have three that are, say, really close to each other, and then you have a fourth one that's kind of far away from the group. Okay, so in other words, if I had, like, shooting at a target, I had that, and then I had that. Okay, it would be nice to be able to throw that outlier out, wouldn't it? because you can see what's gonna happen. If I wanna calculate a mean, that outlier is going to skew your mean. It's gonna affect your mean, isn't it? It also is gonna affect your precision because it's far away from the others. So it's gonna give you probably a skewed mean and an artificially large standard deviation. And both of those things would hurt you in terms of your score, okay? So what you might want to be able to do is say, okay, there's an outlier, can I remove it? Can I take it out and just work with the three data points that are left? Okay, you might think, well, that would certainly help me in terms of my score. So we can't just look at that thing and say, hey, that looks like an outlier, we're gonna throw it out. The only way you can justify throwing out a point without throwing statistics at it is you have to be able to go back and say, okay, if I'm doing a titration, for example, I could definitely tell that, you know, my endpoint looked a little different. I think I over titrated this thing. So that would give you a basis for saying, okay, yeah, I can probably throw that data point out. In other words, my endpoint didn't look like the other three. Okay, so you have to have some physical basis for doing that. Now, what if your endpoints all look the same, but you still got an outlier like that? Then what do you do? Well, then you have to apply statistics to the thing to determine whether that outlier is truly statistically an outlier or not. Okay, and what we do is we use this things called the Grubbs test to do this. I didn't go to my Grubbs test table. You'll have to look at that on your own. But basically the Grubbs test is this. We calculate this Grubbs value, which we call a big G. Okay, and basically it's this. It's a ratio of the absolute value of the outlier, whatever that value is, minus the mean, including all values. So that's the total mean, including the outlier. And then what we do is we're gonna divide that by little s, which is the standard deviation. And you're gonna get a number, okay? So now there's a Grubbs table in there. I think it's table 4-4 in your textbook. And it's got values of G in it, okay? So basically what ends up happening is if your calculated grubs is greater than the G that you find from the table, and I think it has degrees of freedom in it, so you're gonna have a series of Gs there that vary by degrees of freedom or number of observations. I forget which way they couch it. But basically you pull a G for your situation out of the table and compare your calculated G to it. If your calculated G is greater than the G in the table, then you have an outlier. 
And if it turns out to be an outlier, you can throw it out. But the alternative situation is if your calculated G value is less than the G you find in the table, then the data point has to be left in. Okay, so we can't define it statistically as an outlier, okay? So I think I maybe asked you in your homework, do you guys remember whether I had a Grubbs test in there? I think I did, but I don't remember. I know a few of you guys did the homework all the way through. Do you remember if I did one of those? Anybody remember? I don't have it Thanks. on me. I yeah, I don't remember. There wasn't one with the Grubbs test on it. Yeah, there wasn't one. Okay, so I didn't ask you about the Grubbs test. Okay, fair enough. I couldn't remember if I did or didn't. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. All right, so that's pretty much everything you're going to need for statistics throughout the semester. So those four things, mean, standard deviation, confidence level or interval, and how to deal with an outlier, Grubbs test. Those are the four things you're going to need. You won't need to go anywhere beyond that. So there's your statistics in a nutshell, guys. All right, any questions? Now you got everything you need to be able to move forward with the homework, which is where I kind of wanted to get today. Everybody good? Questions. What's that? Um, I missed that. I said I have a couple of questions. Um, yeah, go ahead. So for tomorrow's quiz, could mm -hmm. like is any um, material that we learned up to now fair game? Yeah, sure okay. would be. Um, so I, yeah, I, I could ask you something about stats or what have you, and anything that's in the notes up to this point. Okay, and um, I'm assuming that it's like last semester where we have to have um, our procedure written in our notebook and everything. Correct. Yeah, you would have your your um, table of contents. You'd have your title, purpose, and procedure ready to go. Okay, perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else, guys? Everybody good? All right. Well, if the creek don't rise or freeze over, I'll see you guys tomorrow evening. And if it turns out the weather's just total batshit crazy, and I can't get from Hagerstown here. I'll email everybody and let you know. Because I know some of you guys are commuting onto campus as well from different directions. But hopefully we're late enough that they'll have time to clear all this business out. But, you know, with all these winter storms, you never know what the heck they're going to do. All right, guys. That said, hopefully I'll see you tomorrow. And any questions, you know, I got office hours. Just let me know. Have a nice night. All right, you two guys. I actually have a question, if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. I'm just gonna stop the recording. Yeah, go ahead. Um, it says on our homework that we need to look up the molarity of, of, of concentrated hydrochloric acid. Where should we look?